And I just want to try and talk to you about social license and what it means for the future of our equine and our equestrian sector. Before introducing the idea of a social license, which some of you may be familiar with, I just wanted to set about the context and then, towards the end, bring in some practical implications of that, both from an equine welfare, but also from a communications perspective, before all tying it together at the end. It's probably very trite to say, but we live in a changing world where public's views are evolving. And I would say that's for four reasons. One, we've already heard about it today, social media, a wonderful force for good and for the not so good. Secondly, we live in a society which is increasingly urbanized and therefore the dislocation, the distance between the rural countryside, including horses and society gets ever bigger. Thirdly, the values of society are changing. I think we'd all see that as years go by, our interaction with the planet, the people and animals in that on that planet. And fourthly, the rise and the better organization of animals' rights and the better funded animal rights world. Because you and I both know we have a partnership with our horses, but some believe that's exploitation. And a growing number of people, while we would conform to the idea of use and never abuse, a growing number of people would say, use is abuse. This is a global issue. What happens in Australia or South Africa or the UK or the US is all interconnected. What happens in endurance and racing and polo is all interconnected. And we are on an ethical tightrope warp. And I think we are because of situations like Australia. Last October, a program in the evening showed the horrific plight of thoroughbreds that have come off the track and into an abattoir uh, being treated in a horrific way. And if you read that uh, caption there, the racing industry in Australia has fundamentally failed to intervene at industry level to effectively protect protect retired racing horse, race horses. Those are damning words indeed. But we would be very foolhardy to think that this is just an Australian problem, because it isn't. And the other thing is, as frustrating it can be, public perception and reality can sometimes be completely divorced. But the point that I want to make today is we can't ignore public perception. It may, may not be right, but that's what they think. And of course, this is not just an equine issue, whether we're talking about trophy hunting or live export for slaughter or for research animals. How people interact and view animals, the environment and the people around them are changing. You'll of course be very familiar with many of these headline stories about equestrian sports. I think we've taken about one from every year of the last decade. And we can be fairly sure that every year of the next decade will be no different. But what happens when that spotlight is turned on to those of us who are the everyday riders? When we are just riding out once a week or once a day on our horses, when that's being questioned, that really does bring home how serious an issue this is. And the one thing you've got to remember, we can't simply ignore that. So we've got a changing world, but we've also got a changing understanding of equine welfare. Ever since the beginning, the Cambridge Dictionary has talked about it being physical and mental health and happiness of our animals. And so our understanding of equine welfare is changing. And Professor David Miller in New Zealand, I think, says this so well. It's not just about getting our animals to survive. It's about making sure that they thrive. It's not just about avoiding the negative. And whilst the five freedoms have been fundamentally important over the last 50 years in transforming equine welfare and indeed animal welfare, Life has moved on because we can't just be protecting our animals from negative experiences. And that's why the issue of the five domains is so important. To have the interaction of good nutrition, the environment, behavior, and health impacts on the mental well-being of our equines. And it is as equally important as their physical well-being. And to look at that in a different way, we often talk about the three Fs, freedom, friends, and forage, because we need to remember where our equines came from. They live in herds, in groups, 
grazing for 17 hours a day. Now, of course, in many ways we manage our horses in the 21st century, that's not possible. But we still need to remember how we can incorporate freedom to roll, ad-lib forage throughout the day, and fr friendships, social groups that our horses need to interact to make sure their mental well-being is as good as their physical welfare. So I think this is a real case for where we do need to challenge the status quo. Just because we've trained or managed our horses in a way for years doesn't necessarily make it wrong, but it doesn't necessarily make it right either. And we need to consider that. We certainly need to invest in greater research to understand um, how we can manage our horses better as we understand their welfare um, and their needs for their mental well-being. And we do need to consider what the public think. Why? because we believe we live in a world where equine sport and the equine sector needs to develop its social license to operate. This is not a new concept. It goes back over 200 years, and it came forward very much in the late 90s with huge mining disasters, of great sort of safety disasters of people going underground and getting trapped, but also the environmental disasters that the mining community were often uh, linked in with. The more enlightened and recognise that to be able to have a workforce, to be able to accept it by the, the local community in which they mind, they need to invest in their social licence to operate. And at the heart of that is trust and transparency. And for us in the equine world, it's about doing the right thing by our horses, but also telling people that we're doing the right thing by our horses. I would stress this is not mob rule. This is not the equestrian world having to react to every social media campaign that goes on out there. But it is about being aware of those social media campaigns so we can either stand up and say no, what we are doing is right or we can take on board to say maybe we should be looking how we're doing it. Can you lose your social licence? You most certainly can. The greyhound racing industry in Australia ignored growing pump, public concern around what happened to greyhounds once they came off the racetrack. And as a result, for a short while, it was banned in one state. So you really can lose your social license to operate. And I'm not sure if you can see it, but I think what we need as a sector is to try and work our way down bottom right, because too often people just tolerate or accept what, especially in regards to a question sport, what we're doing. But we need to move to a point where there is broader approval and support for what we're doing. And how do we do that? That's all about basing it on the horse-human partnership. That's what the responsible use of horses in sport and leisure is all about. It requires knowledge, experience, and compassion. Horses are not machines. We need to recognize and show people how we really do care for them in this partnership. Because from a sporting perspective, those who are cared for best are certainly going to compete the best. But also, once they go into their second or third or fourth career, they will have much more long-term prospects. And I think the horse-human partnership, as I'll very briefly say at the end, forms the basis for how we need to be communicating about this. So what are the practical implications? I could talk to you all day about this, but I've chosen just four. We've already heard about it from James. Riding on roads, I applaud the British Horse Society for, for their dead slow campaign, because there clearly is a serious issue with rider and horse safety. But what we need to recognise, for the vast majority of people out there who aren't on the animal rights end or within the sector, are, the vast majority are um, either ambivalent or completely agnostic about what the equine world does. And what we have to happen is on the road is one of the touch points where many of the agnostic or ambivalent will come into contact with horses. So it's so important that what we do as riders on the road actually pro helps protect our safety, but also the safety of the next rider that those drivers come into contact with. 
Secondly, I know many people will have a just sigh with frustration when I bring up the wit. But the reason I do, because it's probably one of the biggest differences between perception and reality. The reality is, if you look at the equine welfare issues around racing, the whip wouldn't be in the top 10. But as far as the public concerned, it's in the top two. And you just cannot simply ignore that. And that's why we have been calling for many years for a public debate around the use of the whip for encouragement in racing. And we applaud the fact that that's shortly going to happen. I have to say, I think that ship has sailed. The ability for the public to accept horses being whipped for encouragement, I think, has gone. But we'll see where we go. But it's not just an issue for racing, because obviously we know that the whip has a role for safety. But in other disciplines have also come under the spotlight. So I think we need to make sure that we explain to the public that narrative is there about why we need to use the whip. Thirdly, too big. Equine obesity, probably the biggest equine welfare, health and welfare challenge facing this country and indeed many countries around the world. Laminitis, equine me metabolic syndrome, to name but two. The health implications of equine obesity are significant, but we're not getting that message through because there is an obesity epidemic. And it's wonderful to see that, that there's a great collaboration around this now, and I, I uh, really do applaud that, but we need to break through through and get horse owners to understand the severity because the spotlight of the public will certainly be coming on this because it's already very much on rider weight. This is not about clearly stopping people riding, but it is about making sure that people ride a horse that's matched to them, their ability and their weight. And we applaud the work that Sue Dyson and the team have done around rider weight, but boy, we need to follow up on that research because we know and we've already seen in a, a social media posts that the public do view that as cruelty. And then finally, routine interventions. When we talk about challenging the status quo, it's all about treating the cause, not the symptoms. And that's why the use of gastrogard, the level of wind in operations in racing, the level of joint medication across the piece, I'm not sure would stand up to scrutiny if, when the public come asking. Because we, we've got to understand, is it ethically justified what we're doing? And I think in this regard, the relationship between the vet and the trainer and the owner, I think, has to come under real scrutiny because I'm not sure we always get that, the balance of that relationship right. And finally, we, when we want to talk about social licence, we've got to really think about the way we articulate it and tell the story to the public because we are, in the main, dealing with the ambivalent and the agnostic. Responsible use of horses in sport and leisure starts with the word use. It's one way. We use horses. The way we ethically justify it is to show how it's a partnership. We don't make it one way. We make it two way. There are benefits to horses and there are benefits benefits to humans, and we really need to articulate that. But I also think we need to think about the lens that we're telling the story through. Because we know, as I've already said, most people don't understand what goes on in the equine world. So when we say we look after our horses like royalty, they would say, that's the minimum you should be doing. What else are you doing? And as much as we applaud the work that's going on in, for example, racing around reducing equine fatalities, it's somewhat perverse, as it, I think it sometimes comes across, to be justifying your sport by saying we killed less horses this year than we we did last year. So I really think we need to think about how we articulate this all. So where do we go next? The social license concept is a collective responsibility. None of us can ignore what the public think about horse sport and horse leisure. Collectively, we've all got to do something about it. We really do need to invest in research because I really believe it when I say it, and I know you say it,
mindset, my horse loves doing this, but actually when you look at the scientific basis to support you on that, it's somewhat shallow. We need to change that. We need to challenge the status quo. We need to say, is the way we're doing it now the right way? Because above all, we have to communicate, we have to tell the story around the benefits of horse sport to horses and humans completely differently. And of course, actions will always speak louder than words. That's why I'm delighted that Barry is going to come and tell us about how British racing is looking to incorporate social license into the future health and prosperity of British racing. Thank you very much.